can you do fertility treatments to have twins? Let's talk about fertility and multiple pregnancies. Hi friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I'm a fertility doctor and this channel exists to help you understand your body, your fertility, and make the choices that are best for you. If you are interested in this, please subscribe. That helps spread our mission of fertility awareness to more people. Today, I'm going to dive into the topic of twins. And I can't tell you how many times people sit across from me and will say innocently, I just want to have twins. Can we have twins? Can we have twins on purpose? And I get it. Like I've been there. I had infertility. I had pregnancy loss. My peers were achieving a stage of family building that I hadn't yet. And that desire to catch up. I, I get it. But the reality is twins carry more risks. Triplets carry more risks. Quads carry more risks. And ultimately, if you are behind or if you are struggling or you're having to go through fertility treatments, the very last thing we want to do is put you in a position to have increased risk. So I'm just going to dive into a few things about twins though, the different types, what causes them and how we approach the situation. So first of all, I think it's really interesting to see how the incidence of twins and multiple pregnancy has just increased over time from 1980. You know, once we really started having fertility treatments, because before then, we didn't have injectable hormones, so you really couldn't do IVF and get multiple eggs, and you couldn't do injectable hormones for IUI. So we really did not have a very high baseline of twins. But you can see this graph has a huge increase, and then it plateaus, and we're finally starting to see a decrease. And this decrease clearly is from change in how we practice, meaning invention of pre-implantation genetic testing, transferring fewer embryos, and putting barriers on IUI and ovulation induction cycles. So this is really good because what we've seen, and I've seen it personally, is these really poor outcomes in patients who have multiples, and it's, it's heartbreaking. One stat that I think is very interesting is if we look at twins, everybody who has twins, most twins are actually naturally occurring. However, people who have fertility treatments, people who undergo any type of fertility treatments have a 20 times higher chance of having twins. And people who undergo fertility treatments have a 100 times greater chance of having triplets. So even though these things might be rare, they're not rare in my patient population or what we do. So understanding the different types of twins is going to be really important. So first of all, there's something called monozygotic and dizygotic. When we think about these different times, what I want you to think about is the egg and sperm source. In dizygotic, they are separate, two completely genetically independent beings. So two eggs, each of them got fertilized by their own sperm. They just happen to get fertilized at the same time. This is the most common type in nature, and this is also the most common type in fertility treatments. So in nature, this is from ovulating two eggs at one time, and we do know this does happen as people get older and the HPO axis sends out a higher signal of FSH because you have fewer eggs, you're more likely to ovulate too. And in certain ethnic groups, you actually have a higher incidence of dizygotic twinning, such as the Nigerian population and even the European population. And the lowest incidence is actually going to be in Japanese. But this is from ovulation of two naturally. In fertility treatments, this is from super ovulation. So having somebody ovulate two or more eggs, Clomid, Femara, or FSH, or FSHLH, that's the number one, your John and Kate plus eight, if you're old, that was from inductable hormones for ovulation induction. So that is what that high order multiple situation was from. And if you do IVF, it's from transferring more than one embryo. So dizygotic twinning, two separate eggs and sperm, that is the number one type. In dizygotic twinning, these are always, a baby has its own amniotic sac and its own placenta. So always, totally independent structures. In monozygotic twinning, this is from an embryo split. One egg got fertilized by one sperm. This embryo then split before or at some stage of the journey. And this can range anywhere from the earlier it splits. So you could have two sacs, two babies, two placentas, but they're the same genetic source. So that's monozygotic, but that's 
dichorionic, diamnionic, meaning chorion, think about placenta, amnion is the amniotic sac. Then you can have kind of a partial split later than that, where you have one shared placenta, but each baby has its sac. So that is still monozygotic, but that is monochorionic and diamnionic. And then you have where they split later. And so you have two babies in the same sac and sharing one placenta, still monozygotic, but that's also what we call mono-mono, meaning one placenta, one amniotic sac. That is the riskiest type of identical twins. And then if they split even later than that, what you can actually see is your conjoined twinning. So your conjoined twinning is where you had an incomplete split and the babies share some of the same structures. So monozygotic twinning, overall in nature is relatively low. It's about four out of a thousand live births. However, IVF specifically increases this. So it at least doubles it. And so most people will quote one to 2% chance of monozygotic twinning with IVF. And interestingly, as IVF has changed over the years, getting to the implantation stage, being in media longer, or having that embryo, the hypothesis is that embryo is, you know, touching the walls of the catheter or how it's manipulated is encouraging it to split after it's in the body. But the moment I put it in, it's still one embryo. Really wild and crazy. Now, of course, this makes it even more complicated with IVF because if I go and I transfer two embryos, you can have one or both of them split. And so this is why people might transfer two but could have quadruplets, two sets of identical twins. And this is so risky. And your odds of actually bringing a baby home are so low in that circumstance. So when we talk about complications that come from twinning, these complications can actually come both on the maternal end and on the baby end. And so here's a graph looking at some of the maternal complications going from singleton to quad or more. And you can see the increase of preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, having preterm labor, and having a really early, very premature baby all increase the more babies you have. And some of these like triplet numbers are striking and scary. When you look at the risk to the baby, these risks are all correlated with the smaller and the earlier the baby is. The less the baby weighs, the earlier it is born, the greater the risk is going to be. And the complications of preterm birth can be pretty significant and severe that people don't always think about. And that is, you know, not having your lungs fully developed, having retinopathy of prematurity or blindness, having cardiac defects, having neurodevelopmental defects like cerebral palsy. And when it comes to growth restriction and having a very small preemie, you also have things like necrotizing intracolitis, which is ischemia of the bowel that can be lethal. You can have brain hemorrhaging that can be lethal. So these babies are not fully developed. And so when we think about, oh, some of these risks don't seem so bad. So what if I have a baby early? That actually is extremely problematic for you taking a baby home. In addition, either the more placentas you have or the more space that is occupied by babies, you have an increased risk for some of the really traumatic, terrible things like a placental abruption when the placenta comes off the wall of the uterus and you bleed internally, a placenta previa where the placenta is covering the cervix and having retained placenta or just overall placenta abnormalities as well. So these things do make twins and multiples so risky and the risk increases the more babies that there are. And I think this is a really interesting graph. If you look at it, you have single twin and triplet. And what we're looking at, if you look at the very bottom is average birth weight and gestational weeks. And you can see that the average weeks of being born, if you're a singleton, is going to be 39. If you are a twin pregnancy, it's going to be 35. And if it's a triplet pregnancy, it's going to be 32. And you can see that those grams of birth weight goes from about 3,300, which is what you would normally consider a seven pound baby, to 2,300 to 1,600. Let me show you a picture of a 1600 gram baby to get the idea of how severe this is. And then also we have a thing called a vanishing twin. And so if you put in a couple embryos, you're thinking I'm trying to increase the chance of somebody getting pregnant and they have one of them that miscarries or vanishes. This happens more commonly when embryos are not genetically tested. You still see an increase in risk to the surviving twin based on how the pregnancy started. So increased risk of early delivery and having a low birth weight. So a remaining twin is not without risk if it started as a twin pregnancy. Now, 
This is confusing to a lot of people, but IVF has changed, right? And so has ovulation induction. For ovulation induction, Clomid or Letrozole are really what we're aiming at most of the time. I have not used gonadotropins, like injectable hormones with ovulation induction or IUI cycles in years now. And so we're really trending away from that. If somebody doesn't respond to those oral medications, we are usually recommending IVF because that means they're likely to over respond in an injectable hormone. Almost all of my triplets that I've ever had from ovulation induction, there's not tons of them, but almost all of them are actually from having injectable hormones used. So steering away from that has allowed there to be such a lower risk to these pregnancies. But also setting guidelines of mature eggs. The younger you are, the fewer eggs should be permitted to proceed with the cycle. If you are older, often you can permit more because not every egg is going to be genetically normal. So I always tell my patients, hi, we're shooting for one to two eggs or one to three or two to four, you know, depending on your age. And almost in no circumstances should more than four mature eggs be permitted. But talk to your doctor if you have that about why and what the risks are for you. Because the more eggs in an ovulation induction cycle, you're ovulating them, the increased risk to have, you know, multiple pregnancies all from independent eggs. With IVF, Practice patterns have changed immensely in the last 15 years, and a few things contribute to this. One is going to be the fact that we have really good freezing techniques that we didn't previously have. So now 99% of embryos survive the freeze thaw if they're taking to the blastocyst stage. So I can grow embryos out to where they have higher chances of implantation, they survive better in freezing, and I have genetic testing where I know which embryos have the highest chance. So if I use an average 40-year-old patient, and let's say they make five embryos, then they should have one, maybe two that are normal. Let's say one for the sake of the argument. They have one genetically normal embryo out of five. I don't know which one it is, right? If I do genetic testing, I do. And then I can just transfer the one normal embryo. If I don't do genetic testing, am I going to make somebody go through five embryo transfers? That's a lot financially, emotionally. And so it was very common before genetic testing to the older you were to transfer more embryos. But now that we have genetic testing, that is only increasing risk without benefit because it doesn't do that embryo any good, even to be a surviving twin from a vanishing twin situation. If I transfer the normal one with an abnormal that starts to implant and then miscarries. So ideally, focusing on what is normal is going to have the highest chance for you. But previously, you can imagine if my embryos weren't going to survive in the freezer very well and you just went through all of this and I didn't know which ones were normal because there was no genetic testing, it was common to grab two or three if you were older and try to shove them in the uterus and give them a higher chance. So practice patterns have changed immensely. And so your doctor coming in recommending a single embryo transfer is now recommending the standard of care. And if your doctor's allowing a double embryo transfer but they're genetically tested, that's actually not the standard of care anymore. Interestingly, people will say, oh, I wanna have twins because it will cost less. And that is actually not true. They're thinking of short-term costs of fertility treatments or transfer, but the costs associated with twins are like five times higher than having a single 10. And that is throughout just the delivery process, prenatal care, and their life. And so, I mean, and this is not just at birth. So even like throughout their life, it is more than double to raise twins than a single 10. And so the argument of it will save me money to have twins is really not that valid. It might save you short-term money, but it increases risk and costs you money in the long term. All right. And then this is the graph of the current recommendations. And so what I want you to focus on is cleavage stage embryos, our day three embryos. We really don't transfer those anymore. That's not really standard of care. Blastocyst embryos, and you can see euploid, meaning genetically normal across the board, no matter your age, one. Other favorable, so this is if you do not have genetic testing, but you're under age 37 or 37 and younger, you should still transfer one embryo. And we're only starting to increase that number as you get older, and you can still see it as equal to or less than. So I think this is important, and I totally understand why patients might be asking about twinning, but understanding the serious adverse events that can come from twins or higher order multiples should really lead us to believe that your embryos are safest in your uterus one at a time. 
I always use the analogy of giving that embryo the entire surface area of your uterus to decide where it wants to implant. Give that placenta the best chance of having a really good implantation, decreasing risks, letting that baby grow and develop as close to maturity as it can. And your other embryos are safer in the freezer waiting until their turn. Again, this is a change in perspective from when IVF first started, but the technology has advanced and it is appropriate to change our practice when technology does advance. So if you come to me, I haven't transferred two embryos in so, so long. We actually just had our first set of Fora twins. We've been open for almost three years and it is from a split of a single embryo. So we are very conservative on this because your goal is to have a baby in your arms, a healthy baby. And that is our goal as well. All right. Thank you guys so much for being here. I appreciate you. As always, you can get more information on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD or follow along with the As a Woman podcast. Thanks.